All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Macbeth sees a dagger hanging in front of him. Hello and welcome back everyone. We have just finished the first act of Macbeth and in today's class we are going to begin the second act. Today we are going to look at the first scene of act 2 and we will try to see how this act becomes the rising action of the play. Following the Aristotelian concept of the tragedy, a play is usually divided into five parts. The first part which we saw in the case of act 1 was the exposition and now in the second act we will be looking at the rising action. This is a very important act when you consider the fact that this act gives you the point where Macbeth begins to lose control, right? So, we will go through the scene line by line and this scene can be divided up further into two parts. The first part of the scene is the part where we see Banco speaking with Macbeth and in the second part of the scene we will see Macbeth all alone speaking to himself in a very important soliloquy which is also called the dagger episode. So this scene is the scene which is referred to as the dagger scene of this play and is usually considered to be a very important scene so far as the development of character is concerned. Stay with me till the end of this lecture and subscribe soon if you haven't done so yet. The scene takes place in Macbeth's castle to be specific on a court within the castle. We see Banco and his son Fleans with a torch before him and Banco first speaks with his son. How goes the night boy? So he wants to talk about the night which appears to be quite dark here. The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. Look at the short sentences. Whenever a playwright deliberately uses short sentences, it means that he's trying to build up a kind of a suspense, a kind of a background. And here we see that they are being very miserly with words. And she goes down at 12. So they are trying to calculate the time and it's almost midnight. I take it it's later, sir. So it's quite night now. Hold. Take my sword. Banco is feeling nervous about his son. Now, they are in a friendly place. Macbeth is Banco's friend. They are inside the castle. So why is Banco so scared? There is husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. Now, this word husbandry, it means... When you take care of your household through cutting down expenses. Tonight, the sky is so dark that Banco feels that the stars are no more shining because the heavens have decided to cut down on their expenses. Okay, so it's a good comparison he is making. Take thee that too. So he gives his son the weapon so that he can protect himself and then he says a heavy summons lies like lead upon me here heavy summons means feeling of sleepiness drowsiness Banco is feeling drowsy constantly but he cannot sleep and yet I would not sleep so something is bothering him he does not want to go to sleep because he feels that if he goes to sleep, if he rests, then evil thoughts will start creeping up in his mind. And he says, Merciful powers, restrain in me the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Repose means rest. 
when you are resting, when you are sleeping, when you are dreaming, then your subconscious begins to work on your mind and you have these evil thoughts. Now, why is Banco in this state of mind? Because Banco has also heard some prophecies and he is also an ambitious man, but he is praying to numb these voices. He does not want to be affected by the evil thoughts, but he registers them. He recognizes them. He is not superhuman. He is as flawed a man as Macbeth is, but he decides not to act upon his flaws. Right? So here, he is different from Macbeth. He hears a noise, a sound, and he quickly takes back the sword which he had given to his son because he wants to defend both of them. Give me my sword. And then Macbeth enters. Who is there? A friend. So look at the kind of suspicious environment uh, full of distrust. And this is not something you expect when you visit a friend's house, do you? What, sir? Not yet at rest, so it's midnight, you are still roaming about. He is also roaming about. The king's abed, he had been in unusual pleasure. So now Banco is talking about Duncan, that Duncan is already uh, you know, retired to his bedchamber and he had been very happy, unusual pleasure. And send forth great largest to your officers. Officers here means the people who served the king on behalf of Macbeth. And the king had sent forth great largess. So he had rewarded them, gifted them in a generous way. We know that Duncan is a very generous guy, so we know this is normal. This diamond, he greets your wife withal. And he has also given a diamond to Lady Macbeth by the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless content. So Duncan is filled with you know, unlimited satisfaction, measureless content and he has recognized the services of Macbeth and his people. Macbeth wants to reply in a formal way. Being unprepared, our will became the servant to defect. Which means that if they were more prepared to receive the king, they could arrange for better entertainment. Which else should free have wrought? All's well. And then Banco, in a very sly way, in a very subtle way, he mentions the weird sisters. Because this is bothering him, you see. This is the last thing he remembers about their journey. So he wants to talk about it. He wants to see what Macbeth has to say about this. I dreamt last night of the three weird sisters. And that is why, you see, he does not want to fall asleep because the moment he falls asleep, he dreams of the weird sisters. And he deliberately chooses to ignore them, to shut them off. But here, he wants to talk about them. To you, they have showed some truth. Some truth because he has become pain of Goddard. So that is some truth. And he is actually implying about the actual big prophecy which they had made that he is going to be the king of Scotland. Look at Macbeth's reaction. I think not of them. So he says this because he is thinking always about them. And he does not want Banco to know about what is going on in his mind. I think not of them. And then he realizes that he might need Banco's support if time comes. Yet, when we can entreat an hour to serve, if we can spare an hour to talk, we would spend it in some words upon that business, uh, if you would grant the time. So he tries to understand Banco's point of view. So we see that Banco is offering Macbeth an alternative viewpoint than what Lady Macbeth had offered. A voice of reason, a voice of normalcy, 
and Macbeth wants to grab hold of Banquo's hand in this case, but he cannot openly speak out about it. At your kindest leisure, if you shall cleave to my consent, if you would take my advice, when it is, it shall make honor for you. So when we'll talk about it, if you take my advice, it will be beneficial for you. So they are like speaking in codes. It's like one political leader speaking to the leader of another like opposition and trying to win him to his side to win an election. I mean, it, this came to my mind maybe because uh, this is election season, but this is a very politically charged conversation. Macbeth is trying to win Banco to his political advantage. He needs some support. Banco is very particular about his standpoint. So I lose none in seeking to augment. So Macbeth is offering Banco honor, additional honor, prestige. Banco says he is happy about honor. He would love to have more honor in his life, but he would not lose honor to gain it. So they are speaking in riddles as if, which means that if he has to do something dishonorable, then political gains don't matter to Banco. So he is very particular about his moral standing. But still keep my bosom franchised. I want to keep my records clean, my chest clean or rather my heart clean of all dirt. I shall be counseled. So if you make sure that I don't have to do anything bad, then I'll be advised. Macbeth understands, gets the signal that he's not trustworthy in this sense. All right. And he bids him Good night, good repose the while. Thanks, sir, the like to you. So Banco and Fleance, they exit. Macbeth gives a very specific instruction to his servant. Go, bid thy mistress, tell your mistress. When my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. What he actually means is that Lady Macbeth should strike upon the bell once she has successfully drugged the chamberlains of Duncan. So this is a code and the servant doesn't understand this. He simply goes with this instruction where Lady Macbeth understands that Macbeth wants her to give the signal that the coast is clear. You can come and kill Duncan. The servant goes off and then something happens. And from here we have the dagger episode. A dagger is like a huge knife used as a weapon to stab people and this is the weapon which Macbeth was going to use to kill Duncan. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, Macbeth sees a dagger hanging in front of him and he bursts out. Is this a dagger which I see before me, the handle toward my hand, come let me clutch thee. So he wants to hold that dagger. He's convinced that this dagger is a real dagger and he can hold it. And then when he tries to hold it, because it's imaginary, he cannot hold it and it vanishes there. I have thee not and yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? So I can see you with my eyes, so you are sensible to sight. But I cannot touch you, so you are not sensible to feelings. And he knows that it's a fatal vision. Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, a false creation, proceeding from the heat oppressed brain? His brain is heat oppressed, it's charged. It's almost burning with this adrenaline rush of murder, of doing something so contrary to human nature that he cannot think properly and he's having these kinds of hallucinations and he knows that this is possible. 
I see thee yet, and he sees it again. In form as palpable as this which now I draw, and then he takes out his own dagger, which he was having in his belt. And he says that you are as palpable. Palpable means something which looks real, which can be touched and felt. So what I see in front of my eyes is something as palpable as one which I am now holding in my hands. And then the dagger begins to move, point at a certain direction. The direction towards Duncan's sleeping quarters. Thou marshalest me the way that I was going. So you're pointing me towards the direction in which I was going. So this dagger is asking Macbeth to go, to move. And such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses. My other senses cannot perceive this dagger. I can only see this dagger. So we have five senses, but only one sense organ is functioning right now, which is like my eyes, because I can only see you. Mine eyes are made the fools of the other senses, or else worth all the rest. I see thee still. And on thy blade, now something happens to the dagger. You can see drops of blood appearing on the dagger. I see thee still and on thy blade and dudgeon gouts of blood, which was not so before. And then he realizes that if there's blood on that dagger, this is definitely not a real dagger because he has not yet killed the king. So he is looking at future now. The witches have the power to look into the future, into the seeds of time. He has now acquired that ability to look into the future and he reacts to it and doesn't want to look at it. He dismisses that image out of his mind. There is no such thing as the bloody business which informs thus to mine eyes. He wants to reason with his, himself and he wants to have some logical analysis of the situation that this is imagination this is not real now over the one half world nature seems dead over the one half world nature seems dead which means that over one hemisphere it's night nature is sleeping and wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep we have seen that Banco, he dreamt of the weird sisters. So dreams are not always associated with happy things. When people dream, they also dream of what they are afraid of, the evil things in their subconscious mind. So dreams can be frightening too and sometimes real nightmares. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings. Hecate was the principal deity of the witches. She was like the guardian angel of the witches and Hecate is called pale because she comes from the underworld. She does not belong to the normal world of people. So it is during these nightly sacrifices made to Hecate when worshippers of Hecate, the witches, they make their offerings and withered murder, alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf. And during this time of the night, the murderer, he uses the word murder here, but it actually refers to the person who is about to commit murder. That is the murderer. He walks in a very stealthy way, in a very sly way, hiding himself. And who is helping this murderer? Alarmed by his sentinel, the wolf. The wolf is the uh, animal who helps the murderer by howling if he is in danger. Thus, with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a beast. This image of Tarquin, Tarquin means here, Sextus. Okay, this is another allusion. You can see the details alongside. Tarquin, he ravished Lucretia and murdered her. Here, Macbeth is referring to all these evil spirits, these murderers, Hecate, 
wolf, Tarquin. So by putting all these images, like within a span of seconds, what he does is he creates an impression of collective evil. And this collective evil is alluring him, calling him. He's afraid that when he walks on the stones, the sound might warn Duncan and wake him up. Thou sure and firm set earth, hear not my steps. Which way they walk, for fear, thy very stones prate of my whereabout. So, prate means to, uh, to talk, to declare. So, if he walks on the stones and they make some rattling sound, others will know that Macbeth is walking. He doesn't want that. He wants to be like Tarquin. He wants to be that stealthy murderer. And take the present horror from the time which now suits with it. If that earth makes any noise, then that will break the silence, the silence which is suitable to the situation. So Macbeth wants everything to be quiet. Whilst I threat, he lives. And now suddenly there is a there is a slight change in the way he is looking at the whole thing. He begins to think about what he is thinking. And he says that the more I talk, the more I think, the more I am scared, the more Duncan lives. And then he realizes, words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. He needs the heat of deed, action, but he is using words. And the more he is using words, the colder his actions are getting. Which means this is the moment where he is turning back towards that good Macbeth spirit. Turning back towards that rational man, towards that logical man, thinking man, who has a conscience. And right when he is starting to turn, what happens, you see, the bell rings. I go. And that bell kind of jolts him out of his, his pause, his cold thoughts, his hesitation, it boldens him up. And what is that bell? That bell is nothing but Lady Macbeth. Whenever we see him wavering, Lady Macbeth builds him up, makes him strong, makes him determined. And when she is not physically present even there, her presence makes all the difference. Because this bell is rung by Lady Macbeth. I go and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. Knell is the death bell which is rung in the church when somebody dies and is, is a sign of mourning and it represents death. So this bell which Lady Macbeth is ringing to call Macbeth is the death bell for Duncan. It's a knell for Duncan. And Macbeth doesn't care if Duncan will go to heaven or hell. All he wants to do is now go and kill him. These two lines again in rhymes and we know what that means. And at the same time, remember these two lines where he says, Hear it not, Duncan. Because these words will come back as haunting echoes later in the play. And then I will make you remember today's class again. So we need to understand two things about this scene. First is the episode between Banco and Macbeth. According to Hollinshed, interestingly, Banco was involved in the murder of Duncan. Involved in the way he did not go and kill Duncan, but he knew about what was going on and he was supportive of Macbeth. So why did Shakespeare depart from that source? First is Shakespeare probably wanted to create Banco 
as a figure opposite to Macbeth, as a foil to Macbeth, as everything what Macbeth is not. So we see that although they experience the witches together, the actions which they take later are so different. So Macbeth wants to create a foil, a parallel character against which we can judge Macbeth. The second thing is, in any successful tragedy, you must isolate the main character, make him alone, lonely. Because if there is even one sympathizer, even one person who knows you, who loves you, who believes in you, your downfall is not complete. So from the beginning, we will see that the journey of Macbeth is like a journey towards desolation, towards alienation. Everything he had, he, the subjects, the loyal friends, his wife, everything collapses on the way. And this gradual path of alienation is the path of annihilation. Annihilation means when you don't exist anymore. So in order to make Macbeth truly a tragic hero, Shakespeare had to make sure that Banco was out of the equation. There is a third reason which I believe might have been responsible for this, although I cannot uh, give you any sources uh, for this. This is a general uh, feeling which I have is that Banco's descendants, later on, Banco's um, children and their children, they became kings. And his descendants happened to end up being the kings of England. Now, Shakespeare was patronized by the Queen of England, Elizabeth. No matter what he wrote, he had to make sure that he could not directly hit the royalty of England. Now, if he presented Banco in an evil light, maybe he could have less support of the queen and that might endanger his relationship with the crown and I don't know, that might be a thing at the back of his mind because writers in those days really had to depend on their patrons to ensure the continuity of their work and to ensure proper sponsorship. So that was probably a thing happening in his mind. I don't know that for sure, but that's a thought worth thinking about. The Second part of the scene, the dagger episode, is extremely important because it shows that when left alone, Macbeth is still capable of reasoning, he is still capable of speaking against himself, but he cannot stick to his conclusions with any show of determination. There is no determination in him. Is Lady Macbeth the fourth witch then? This answer demands a more detailed study of the whole book. Someday we will be able to discuss it, I am sure, and very soon. But today we have reached the end of the first scene of the second act. And when we will go through the next scene, we will see how Shakespeare makes his language a vehicle of such action. So stay tuned till then and thank you all for your support. Write in the comment section anything you feel about this scene which I have not covered or any discussion which you want me to have. Thank you once again. This is Monami Mukherjee. You were watching Nibble Pop.